weapons in Monster Hunter are not made equal. Some of these can be quite simple to pick up and use, whereas some other weapons take quite a long time for you to learn and actually get good at them. Hunting with a new weapon you're not used to can make the game feel a lot different and give you a completely different experience. So in today's video I'm going to be ranking all the 14 weapons in Monster Hunter World, but it's going to be a little bit different, I will be ranking them in terms of difficulty. Basically how easy it is for a newcomer to the series to pick up and use a weapon, but also how easy it is for them to actually master it. So whether you are a new hunter, playing the game for the first time, or you are a veteran of the series that is looking for a new weapon to learn, then this is the video for you. With that being said, hello everyone, my name is Dark Hero and let's get started. Let's start with the Sword and Shield, a weapon that the game itself describes as being a beginner friendly weapon. Now the Sword and Shield is a very fast weapon with lots of very fast attacks that have not a lot of recovery frames and so it is very easy for you to string together all kinds of different combos. You can go from doing sword attacks to apply elemental damage or status effects to perform shield attacks which do blunt damage and possibly KO monsters. But because there is such a big variety when it comes to options for the Sword and Shield, that means that there is much greater room for error, so if you perform a wrong combo at the wrong time, you might may just simply miss on a lot of damage. Now while the sword and shield may be a weapon that comes with a shield so you can block which makes things a little bit easier for you and it also lets you consume items without you having to sheath your weapon, it's actually a lot more complex than it may initially seem. There is a lot of tech to master with the sword and shield like for example going from having your weapon unsheathed directly into a backstab and then into a flurry rush and then looping that flurry rush to get the most damage output possible. And in case you don't know, flurry rush, which is this move right here, has a perfect timing which is when your character glows red, and that will increase the damage output. You can also go directly from a backstab into a charge slash and then into a falling bash, or even from a charge slash into a jumping attack, which is a great way for you to get mounts. But you can also use advancing slash to get on top of a ledge or off a ledge, to very easily proc mounts on the monsters and this backstab has invisibility frames so mastering it is key to being a good sword and shield player and you can also simply do an advancing slash from that backstab or if you just want to cancel that you can simply do this which you do by simply holding the left analog stick on top of that, a very key addition that the Sword and Shield has received since the Iceborne expansion is the ability to go from having your weapon unsheathed, very quickly guarding and rolling at the same time and then go into a clutch claw like so. This is the Claw Uppercut, which enables you to tenderize a monster part very very quickly with a single hit. And then you can also use Slinger Burst to go into a Flurry Rush. So again, because you have so many amazing options at very different times, Sword and Shield is all about mastering them and knowing when it's best to use each one individually, and so it becomes a weapon that, while it may be very easy to pick up and use, and you're definitely not going to have a hard time dealing damage with this weapon, getting the most out of it is going to be very very difficult. In simpler terms, I would say that the Sword and Shield is a weapon with a very low skill floor, but with a very very high skill ceiling. And so while it is a weapon that the game classifies as a beginner weapon, I'm actually going to rank it as a medium tier difficulty. The next weapon that I have for you are the Dual Blades. Now the Dual Blades are these very fast and agile weapons that are able to dance around the monster all the while dealing damage all the time. The whole idea of the Dual Blades is entering demon mode by pressing the R2 button, increasing your gauge to dish out a lot of damage with these very powerful and quick hits, including the blade dance whenever a monster is down or you have a big opening, and if your gauge below the sharpness meter is filled up, then you enter what is called the arch tempered mode where, without even having to be in demon mode, you gain access to more powerful moves, although you don't get this very cool and fast dodge that you get in demon mode. So yeah, dual blades are all about getting in and then dashing out very quickly. Stamina management becomes incredibly important with this weapon, as with demon mode and as you are constantly dashing around all over the place, you are constantly running out of stamina and you need to be very careful and decisive about when to do each, because if you do get hit while you are in demon mode, like so, your stamina is still draining the entire time even if you get down. 
So you need to be very, very careful about that. Now, when it comes to dealing damage, the Dual Blades aren't the greatest unless you have some very specified and optimized builds for elemental damage. Unfortunately, I cannot show this to you here, but their strongest attack involves jumping off a wall like this or sliding down a hill and doing this attack where you basically just spin around the monster and deal tons of damage that way. So if you are playing Dual Blades, find the closest hill because that is going to be your best friend when it comes to dealing as much damage as possible. The Dual Blades combos themselves are actually quite simple. Mostly consistent of round slashes for mobility and then the triangle attack to deal some damage. And of course you've got the blade dance to get the most damage output whenever you get a big knockdown. And even outside of demon mode you've also got demon flurry to deal some decent damage very quickly. Now one really cool addition that we got in an update after the Iceborne expansion was the ability to use the clutch claw and tenderize with a single hit after performing a couple of round slashes like so making the Dual Blades and the Sword and Shield the only light weapons that are able to tenderize in a single hit, which is of course extremely helpful. And another very cool thing about the Dual Blades is that at several points throughout your combos you can use your Slinger Burst to perform what is called an Evade Shot, which lets you get out of the way and dodge an incoming attack. You're able to do this at several points throughout your combo, making the weapon even safer. And of course, since this evade shot is considered a slinger burst, you will often flinch a monster this way. All in all, I would say that the Dual Blades are a very powerful and easy weapon to pick up and use, although there is a level of micromanaging that you need to take into account. You need to keep track of your stamina at all times, as well as your demon mode, but I don't think that's too much to ask. And because they are a very mobile weapon with a lot of very fast and low commitment attacks, I think I'm going to place the Dual Blades as an easy weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World. And now it's time to talk about the Greatsword. Greatsword is one of the simplest weapons in the entire game, but that does not mean that it is the easiest to use. Not by a long shot. Being such a slow and hard hitting weapon means that positioning becomes even more essential to this weapon compared to the rest, as if you happen to miss the true charge slash, you're going to be missing out on a lot of your damage. This right here is where most of your damage is going to come from, unless you spend the entire hunt basically just running, doing the overhead slash, cheating your weapon and doing more of the same. And because it is a charge weapon, Understanding the different timings of the weapon, knowing when to tackle to interrupt monsters or to armor through the monster attacks, to then land at TCS is key to being a good greatsword player. And of course, you need to learn to not overcharge the weapon, because you will simply be dealing less damage if you happen to do so. Greatsword also has a guarding capability. So that means that at least you have that safety net if you ever find yourself in a tough spot and your best option is to block an attack. But of course, whenever possible, you may just want to tackle through that attack so that you level up your charge and land that TCS. One thing that has made Greatsword users' life a little bit easier was the introduction of Slinger Burst in the Iceborne expansion, which basically lets you skip one of the animations of your Greatsword Charge while also doing the Slinger Burst animation, which will a lot of times flinch the monster. And if you happen to use a powerful ammunition, like the Thorn Pots for example, you're going to increase your damage output, which is always nice. There are a few more key things to mastering the Greatsword, such as using the Side Blow, just to deal a little bit more damage, reposition yourself or to avoid an incoming attack and then go into the TCS, or for example, when you're charging up a TCS. But you see that the monster is about to move, you go into a tackle, into a jumping wide slash, which still does a lot of damage. And then you use that side blow to kind of reset that combo. So let's do that one more time. The monster is about to move, so we go into a jumping wide slash, side blow, and then we can start doing the same charge up again. And a very cool thing about this is that you can go from the jumping wide slash into a slinger burst into a TCS. So again, despite being frankly a very simple weapon, Greatsword ends up being one of the most difficult weapons to master in the entire game. And so I will be ranking Greatsword as a hard weapon on the tier list. 
Now the next weapon on the list is going to be the longsword. The gameplay loop of the longsword is very very simple actually. You see it's all about leveling up your spirit gauge which is that sword icon below the sharpness meter and once it is red and you are fully charged you'll be able to unleash some very powerful and devastating attacks. As your spirit gauge is going to level up and give you more damage with each of the three levels. So once your spirit gauge is red you'll be able to unleash devastating attacks like this. Now the weapon itself and its combos it is very mobile and it has a very long reach which is why picking up the longsword and using it can be very easy. However there is a mechanic to the longsword that can be a little trickier and that is the counter. I cannot properly show it here to you in the training area but basically as long as you have some spirit gauge you're able to press R2 and circle at the same time to perform what is known as the foresight slash. By doing this you're able to basically parry an incoming attack and if you manage to do it successfully not only will you avoid taking damage but you can also press the R2 button again and if you connect with a monster you'll be able to level up your spirit gauge that way. So it can basically be used as a shortcut so that you don't have to do your spirit combo just to level up your spirit gauge. Learning the monster's attack patterns and being good at timing the foresight slash is key to being a good longsword player as otherwise you'll be missing out on some good damage and this weapon is all about evading attacks all the while dealing damage. However that is not your only way of dealing damage. There is also of course the AI spirit slash. So basically after any attack you can sheath your weapon by performing the special sheath and you can go into one of two attacks. The EI Slash and the EI Spirit Slash which consumes one level of your spirit gauge. The basic version simply makes it so that your spirit gauge can start regenerating on its own so that you always have meter to be able to do the spirit combo so you can keep leveling up your sword gauge very easily and the EI Spirit Slash deals a lot of damage and the best thing about the EI Spirit Slash is that if you nail the timing like so, you won't consume a level of your spirit gauge so you can keep up the aggression. Overall I would say that the longsword is a very easy weapon to pick up and use, it's very easy to just do the regular combos, going into red, doing a few spirit combos and then using the helm breaker and because the weapon has a very long reach you can very easily nail the monster even if they are pretty far away. However, learning the timing for the different longsword parries can be a bit tricky and knowing when to use the different parries at the right time, there is a lot of mastery and skill expression in that, but because the base weapon as is can be very simple and easy, I think that I'm going to rate the longsword ultimately as a medium difficulty weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World. The next weapon is the Lance. Now the Lance is a weapon that despite what may seem at first is actually a lot more complex than you may give it credit. Yes you can simply do these triple thrusts and backstab right away and eventually guard whenever the monster is about to attack you but there is a lot more you can do. A lot of people think that this is a very slow and clunky weapon since you only can move with these steps but it's actually quite mobile thanks to its big dash which you can keep going for a very long time, you can even change directions like so. And of course you've got the guard dash and the reverse guard dash. Now it's not easy for me to showcase exactly what the lens can do here since there's nothing that can attack me besides this barrel bomb in the training area. But the fundamental of the lens is that it is a very reliable weapon that is able to dish out damage constantly. Since you have so many ways to block monster attacks, keep on countering, even guard dash through attacks, you're going to be able to maintain damage uptime on the monster very easily and since of course you come with the shield, you're able to block pretty much anything very easily. And with the Iceborne expansion you even have the clutch counter which allows you to block a monster attack while still grappling onto them so that you can very easily tenderize a monster. And because it is a heavy weapon and you can do it with a single hit, it's very very easy for you to keep a monster tenderized throughout the entirety of the hunt. You don't have to look out for big openings to clutch claw, you can use the monster's offensive attacks as a way to actually tenderize it. Now something that is not so beginner friendly about the lens is that it kinda requires you to use some skills or at least the weapon becomes a lot better with them. 
Skills like Guard 3, for example, at the very least, allow you to withstand a lot of attacks while blocking, so you are not pushed back a lot of distance and you can keep up with your aggression. Guard Up is a nice comfortable skill, which allows you to block unblockable attacks, and Offensive Guard is a very good way for you to keep a 15% raw damage increase after you perfect guard. So you gain a lot of benefits by just having these decorations, which you may not necessarily have, especially when you are early on into the game. Another downside to the lance is that it burns through sharpness quicker than pretty much most weapons in the game, including even the dual blades. Which is why if you don't have skills like Master's Touch, you're going to run into the problem where you have to constantly keep sharpening your weapon. But because the lance has such a solid foundation, where most of its attacks are rather simple and you can keep attacking the monster, and because the lance itself has pretty good reach and you are able to aim your attacks up so even if the monster is very large you can still hit the head, all of this means that the lance is essentially just a very strong weapon even for a beginner player that is going to reliably carry them throughout most of the game. And while again yes there are many optimizations and things to master in skill expression with the lens, a lot of it comes down to timing being able to perfect guard incoming attacks, either by using your counter thrust or guard dash, or even just a regular well timed block, I think the lens ends up being one of those weapons that simply has a very low skill floor, while still being a weapon that has a very high skill ceiling that rewards the players that have put the time to learn it and to properly master it. And because it doesn't have any complicated combos, and very often it's very clear what combos you should be doing to get the most damage output out of this weapon, I'm actually going to be ranking the lens as a medium difficulty weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World. The next weapon that I have for you is the Gun Lens. There's actually quite a few things going on with this weapon. For one, you've got the basic shelling, and you've got to keep track of your ammunition at all times. On top of that, you can do this shelling after each poke, and you can use it to aim at various different parts of the monster, but then you've also got all of the different gunlance combos and the different gunlance playstyles, and all of which are various different things that you have to master. For example, you can do poke, shell, shell, poke. You can go with the full burst playstyle, you can even play with charged shells by doing shell shell and then charged shell. You've also got the option to do a wyvern's fire at all times which you can aim, which lets you do a powerful move that deals plenty of damage, but leaves you vulnerable and then it becomes on cooldown so it is something that you need to keep in mind. And of course with the addition of the Iceborne expansion you now have the ability to load up any ammunition you pick up into your gun lens so that whenever you apply the worm stake cannon you'll basically attach this device to a monster and whenever you do a shell as you can see right there it does an extra tick of damage. So you can do things like this, do a full burst, load up your shells again and then use the Wormstake Cannon to do these massive explosions. All of that for a little bit of extra damage. And of course the Gun Lance, just like with the Lance, is a weapon that doesn't have a typical dodge roll, you have this backstab, so while you do have a shield and while you do have some armor whenever you are firing your shells or even reloading, you need to keep in mind that you have a very immobile weapon, that is kind of reliant on you having a Vade Extender or just being very good at using the backstab to get away from danger. There is a lot more to this weapon than it may initially seem, and understanding how to properly get the most out of each of the different Gunlance playstyles can be very very difficult. Personally, I think that I'm only decent at doing the full burst playstyle because frankly it is quite simple, but again there is so much to this weapon that you have to master that I think that, especially for a newcomer to the series having to keep track of all of these different things, it can be especially quite difficult, and as the gun lens is a weapon that does not have the highest damage output apart from maybe an exploit, and it being a weapon that is reliant on so many skills like capacity boost or artillery, and again being a weapon that burns through sharpness very very quickly, I think that it is fairly valid for me to place the gun lens as one of the hardest weapons to learn in Monster Hunter World. Now the next weapon is the charge blade, and man oh man there is a lot to talk about here. 
This is one of those weapons that once you start to get a basic understanding of how it works, it can feel like the simplest weapon in the game because you can keep doing the same rotation over and over and things will work out. But having that first basic understanding of the weapon can be quite troublesome especially for newer players to Monster Hunter. So for starters the charge blade is a weapon that can go from a sword and shield into the axe mode so you can go from this moderately fast weapon that even has some mobility and is of course able to guard to a pretty slow yet beefy axe. And of course the thing with the sword and shield is that you gotta charge up the shield by doing attacks in sword mode like so, then you spend those files to charge up the shield, then you charge up the weapon and from then on you have a few different options. Now even just charging up the files there is some mastery to this, there are different combos that can be faster than others and understanding what each of these buttons do and when to use them and also the fact that you have a sidestep, already there's some mastery to it. And of course there's the whole aspect of using the super amped elemental discharge which you have to be good at aiming it so that you land the whole discharge to deal the most amount of damage possible on the enemy. You can also go from this into a basic amped elemental discharge by only consuming one file and this is often done to snipe the head of a monster whenever it is doing an attack or whenever you feel like you are committed to doing an elemental discharge but you don't think you're going to quite land it, you can do that to cancel the attack. You can of course still use the axe mode but it's not particularly useful to spend your files or even spend any time doing this. Then there's also the option to charge the sword of the sword and shield so now you have two things that you have to worry about. It doesn't consume any files but that's yet another thing that players need to be aware of so that's another thing that adds complexity to the weapon. But again just doing that and spamming SADs there isn't a lot that is very complicated about this once you understand the basic rotation of the weapon. Do I do think things become a little bit more complicated once we start talking about guard points? Like so. The cool thing about the guard points is that you can follow them up with a super amped elemental discharge. So it's basically like a shortcut for you to do this massive attack. And also if you have offensive guard equipped, that skill will trigger and so you'll be able to deal even more damage. But that is something else to keep in mind, guard points are extremely useful for the charge blade. Not only is it a safe mechanism, a way for you to be able to block damage, but it can also be used offensively. So mastering the guard points is an essential core aspect of the charge blade that every player should master. On top of that there is something that we haven't really spoken about and that is of course the new addition from the Iceborne expansion, the Savage Axe. By pressing the L2 button as you are about to do a super amped elemental discharge you go into the Savage Axe mode where your axe mode now becomes a lot more useful. As you can see it's basically like a chain so you're doing multiple hits each time it connects and it does a lot of damage. And the very cool thing about this is that you can go into sword mode, charge up those files and then you can go back into axe mode and you'll be able to keep using it again. And you don't even need to swap forms like I did just there, you can simply do this and you'll be back into axe mode. Now the charge blade becomes in my opinion a lot harder to use properly when you are in the savage axe mode because these attacks have a lot of commitments, you are not very mobile while doing this and with the super amped elemental discharge you can kinda do them from a distance. So it's best for you to use this whenever you have a big opening so you unleash all of these attacks on the monster and whenever your file is about to run out swap back into sword and shield mode you don't even need to load all of those files and you go back into axe mode. And you can even do slinger burst in the middle of it if you ever feel the need to which can of course a lot of times interrupt the monster and you can keep unleashing the axe attacks. Like so. Having two wildly different playstyles on a single weapon is already something to keep in mind that can be tough for someone especially new to understand. And when landing all of these hits in succession isn't the easiest thing in the world and you're also stuck while doing all of these high commitment attacks and you have a lot of min maxing and micromanagement to do, it's easy to see how this weapon could be tough for someone to learn and so I think that it is safe for me to place the charge blade as one of the hardest weapons to learn in Monster Hunter World. 
Next on the list we have the Switch Axe, the second transforming weapon in the game. This weapon is all about going between the Axe mode and the Sword mode. Or at least that's in theory. In reality in Monster Hunter World you're going to spend most of your time in Sword mode. As you can see I'm powering up the gauge and now that the weapon is empowered, whenever I hit the monster in Sword mode, you can see that there are these explosions, these files that do extra damage. But of course whenever you run out of battery, you'll have to recharge it. And that is whenever you play in Axe mode to start refilling the battery. And there is actually quite a bit of depth within the Axe mode. You can go from these wild swings, which is a really good way to deal damage on a monster that is KO'd, into a slinger burst, into a transforming combo, which will put you in sword mode, deal a lot of damage, and you can get right back into starts, powering up your sword gauge. And then when it is fully powered up, you can go into the zero sum discharge. Now right there I did not attach myself to this training dummy because it is a training dummy. But one thing you can do since the Iceborne expansion is as long as your switch axe is in its empowered state, you can clutch claw onto a monster and perform a zero sum discharge directly. Which means that the switch axe is the perfect weapon whenever you have to take advantage of a clagger opportunity. But again when you are in sword mode there's really not a lot of depth to the weapon. All you do is spam these combos right here. And there's not much to it, but being able to recharge the weapon and the various ways that you do it is where the depth of this weapon is. While you are performing a wild swing you can go into a heavy slam by pressing the triangle button and now the weapon does extra exhaust damage being able to kill the monsters more easily. You've also got these rising slashes and overhead attacks that can reach very high and you can also perform a phase slash to get away from the monster, go into a slinger burst get back into sword mode and close the gap very quickly. But again the combo that I think is best to get back into sword mode is going into wild swing, slinger burst and then perform this morphing combo which does a lot of damage and allows you to get close to the monster and then you can perform the zero sum discharge and keep on attacking in sword mode. You can think of the switch axe as kinda like a greatsword that needs to be empowered because it is so slow and because you need to charge it. But again when you are in sword mode there is not quite a lot to it. But you need to keep in mind that there are a lot of attacks that have high commitment and that whenever you are in axe mode you don't actually get the basic roll whenever you are attacking. You get the side steps which can be a little bit tricky and so a lot of switch axe players end up playing with a vade extender simply because of this reason so that is something else to keep in mind. There are a lot of moving parts to the switch axe and I definitely think that it is a complicated weapon but when it comes down to it all that really matters is getting into sword mode and performing the super amped elemental discharge and the different combos which the combos themselves are also quite simple composing of overhead slashes and double slashes so when it comes to just learning the basics of this weapon and getting a simple understanding of the switch axe I do believe the switch axe is a medium level difficulty weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World despite having a lot to master with this weapon. The next weapon on the list is going to be the hammer. Now the hammer is a very simple and straightforward weapon that is all about dealing damage to a monster's head and making sure that they stay down so you can deal the most damage possible. You have some very simple combos like the big bang combo where you just spam the same button over and over again and you'll deal a ton of damage and you've also got the triangle combo which ends with the golf swing. However one of the main mechanics of the hammer is that you are able to charge it so while you are doing it you're basically spending stamina at the same time but you gain access to a few different moves depending on your charge level. So if you charge it just once you get the side blow which can combo into any of those combos I mentioned. If you charge it twice you get this uppercut that is a little bit of a dash called the brutal upswing. And if you charge to level 3 you get a couple of very powerful options. If you simply let go of the R2 button, you're going to perform the spinning bludgeon which deals a lot of damage especially on the final hit. As you can see 743 for just 3 different hits. But if you are holding a direction on your analog stick or pressing one of the WASD keys, you'll perform a spinning bludgeon like this which allows you to be a lot more mobile 
control the direction and you can actually press the triangle button at the very end for a very strong upswing. That being said, the hammer has yet another mechanic. You're able to power charge your hammer by pressing the circle button as well while you are charging. And now you have this red aura around your hammer that simply makes you deal more damage, although you lose that aura after some time or if you get hit by pretty much anything. So be careful about it. Another awesome thing about the hammer is that at any point while you are charging you're able to do a slinger burst and you still maintain the level of charge on your hammer. And another fantastic thing about it that makes it such a good weapon to use especially in the Iceborne expansion is that following the basic spinning bludgeon you can tap the clutch claw button to quickly grapple onto the monster and perform a clutch claw attack. And the same thing goes for the level 2 charge as you can see right here we get a brutal upswing and we clutch claw onto the monster. Very useful indeed. The sliding attack of the hammer is also a very big highlight for it. You get this mid-air bludgeon which you can then follow up with a clutch claw as well or go into one of your big combos. Overall the weapon itself is all about holding the charge, knowing when to dodge out of the way, when to use the level 2 charge as opposed to level 3 charge. The only thing you need to be careful about is that you don't miss your big bang combo, because if you do, then the combo is going to stop right there and you're going to stop in the middle of your tracks and you may get hit by an attack. So overall the hammer is a fairly mobile and simple weapon to use, most of its attacks don't have a ton of commitment and because you're able to hold your charge as much as you want, as as long as you have stamina, you have a lot of freedom to decide whenever it is a good time for you to attack and so you are able to look out for a lot of openings, whereas you wouldn't otherwise be able to with a lot of other weapons or at least it wouldn't be as easy. So having given all of these reasons, I think that it is fair for me to say that the hammer is one of the easiest weapons to learn in Monster Hunter World. The next weapon on the list is one that used to be my main for a very long time and that is none other than the Hunting Horn. Now this weapon gets a lot of stigma for being a support weapon when it is actually quite strong and competent at dealing damage even when you're playing solo. So of course the main thing about the Hunting Horn is having the different buffs for you to be able to buff yourself as well as your allies. A lot of people seem to believe that this is very complicated, but thankfully the game itself shows you the notes at all times, as you can see they are displayed on the top right, what each of the different button presses is going to do, and what each of the different melodies are so that you can always see whatever it is that you need to press. And whenever it comes to playing the actual melodies, it's quite simple, all you have to do is quite simply look out for a big opening on a monster, often you'll wait for a breath attack where you stand below the monster and you wait for the opportunity to dish out some big damage while also playing these melodies which can deal again pretty decent damage. Now it is true that the hunting horn is a fairly slow weapon and there are quite a few things to optimize with it. For example you've got these two big hits which you often want to do whenever the monster is KO'd and there are quite a few more mechanics to it like for example whenever you press the circle button you can press a different button while that animation is playing as you can see I press triangle and the note was actually played so you can think of it as a shortcut to get to a different melody. As you can see I did not do the animation for the triangle and circle notes but it still shows up and so the melody is complete and I can still get attack up. There's also something you can do after pressing each button note which is pressing the triangle button while holding backwards on the analog stick to do this little stabby attack which actually does cutting damage, you can actually cut tails with this. It doesn't do a lot of damage but it's quite simply a way for you to get the triangle attack very fast or in case you don't want to do any more melodies you simply want a shortcut to get back into a different attack. You can keep on spamming this so that you get back to that big attack very very quickly. There are also shortcuts from different songs, for example I can simply do triangle and R2 and that is going to play first. So if I don't have a lot of time, that is something you can do to get a melody very very quickly. And then of course there are the impact waves which were added with the Iceborne expansion, which are one of the better ways to deal KO damage to a monster. It deals a ton of damage, you can keep on pressuring it like this by pressing the L2 button after any move. And then you've got the impact echo wave songs which do a lot of damage and will often KO monsters. And of course they also have the opportunity to put down a buff that teammates can pick up 
in this case being maximum stamina up as well as recovery. So despite there being quite a lot to the hunting horn, I do believe that it is a fairly simple weapon to pick up and use, although optimizing and getting the best out of it can be a little bit tricky, but it's definitely nothing too complicated. And I think that if you chose to put enough time into this weapon, and especially if you play with other players, you're going to be rewarded with one of the most fun weapons in the game, that despite the game telling you is a support weapon, is actually quite powerful. So all in all, I think I would put the Hunting Horn as a medium difficulty weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World. Next on the list we have the Inset Glaive, and this weapon has a lot of micromanaging to it. So basically what you do with the Inset Glaive is you send out the Kinsects, by doing so you aim at different parts of the monsters, and you try to collect a different extract from it. Each of them come with a different corresponding color, giving you a different buff, and when you have all three gathered up, you'll gain a massive buff on top. I've covered all of this in depth on my Inset Glaive guide, but basically you always want to have the red buff, which is what gives you a new moveset for the weapon, which you do not have access to unless you have the red buff. So the gameplay loop of the Inset Glaive is basically that, you send out the Kinsect, and only after you collect the different extracts is when you really start attacking the monster. The combos themselves are actually pretty simple, and you even have an infinite combo that you can keep spamming, so when you have a big opening on a monster, you can do this for a long ass time. And then you finish like this whenever the monster is about to get up. But of course, the cool thing about the Kinsect is that you can vault into the air. And you can do all sorts of aerial attacks. You can also dash right away. And you can do this jumping slash where you fall down and hit multiple times on the monster. And with the addition of the Iceborne expansion, you have some really cool things you can do. For example, you can go from being vaulted into clutch clawing the monster right away. And you've also got this descending thrust, which deals a lot of damage and will also mark the monster so that your Kinsect will attack it periodically and also create these dusts, which you can then blow up. And depending on the Kinsect you have, that is going to correspond to a different effect. It can heal you, poison the enemies, paralyze them or do blast damage. And another thing you can do in the Iceborne expansion is while you are aiming your Kinsect, you can press triangle and circle at the same time and perform what is called a Kinsect charge. Which will have different effects depending on the Kinsect, like extending the duration of the triple buff or increase the stamina and damage of your Kinsect. And that is basically it. There's not much else to the Kinsect. This dodge slash right here that I just did does not have iframes, it's not even something that you have to master the timing, it's more so to reposition. Yes, there are different types of kinsects, and learning where to get the exact extracts you want from a monster can be a bit tricky at first. You can use this handy infographic that I've made as a basic rule of thumb for every monster in the game, but you kinda don't need to worry about most of it. With most monsters, your basic gameplay loop is going to look something like this. You get the red extract, aim at the monster, go for the clutch claw, slap him three times so that you can then tenderize at the, after the third slap. And while you may not have the triple buffs, you go ahead and you do the Kinsec charge and you start doing the sending thrusts. And again, just like there, Eventually the Kinsect will grab the buffs that you need, and then you can start playing the Inset Glaive normally, doing the right combos, depending on what the monster is doing. And of course you can also mix it up with the aerial playstyle, and spam the sending thrust if you ever feel like you don't have a lot of room to be flying around the map, but you also want to be safe and attacking at the same time. So despite having to manage three different buffs, the Kinsect stamina and all of that, I think that the Insect Glaive is a rather simple weapon when it comes to actual execution, there's not a lot of room for error, and so even if you are a beginner player, all you need to know is collect the buff and then start spamming the aerial combos, and things will work out for you. And so despite the Insect Glaive being one of my most used weapons in this game, I'm actually going to rank it as one of the easiest weapons to use in Monster Hunter World. The next weapon on the list is going to be the bow. Now the bow itself being the first of the ranged weapons is actually a lot more mobile compared to the rest of them. As you are able to while holding your charge, simply sidestep and increase the charge level of your bow or at the very least maintain it. And when it comes to actual damage or overall DPS, it's actually fairly simple when it comes to dealing optimal damage with the bow. You pretty much just want to do a charge sidestep, 
into power shots and keep on doing this over and over again. However, the problem is that you do spend a ton of stamina doing this, so you also need to figure out what else to do in that time. You can, for example, do quick shot into power shot. It's a nice way to deal some decent damage at close range to the monster, and you are able to regain your stamina. But overall, the basic gameplay of the bow itself is fairly simple. You kind of just dance around the monster doing charge shots and power shots, and make sure that you don't run out of stamina as much as possible. Of course, managing your files, making sure that you always have power coatings and enough items to craft even more power coatings and being able to tap them in your radial menu or a shortcut on a mouse and keyboard is essential to being a good player. And then you can have some extra coatings if your bow allows it, like sleep coating and poison coating. But because you may run out of coatings very easily or you may just not have a lot of them, especially if you are a newer player, you need to be careful about making sure that you don't use all of it and you need to do some farming as well. And when you run out of coatings, you'll have to play with the close range coating, which basically is going to force you into a closer distance between yourself and the monster so that you are at the ideal range to deal as much damage to the monster as possible. And again, doing this all the time, making sure you don't run out of stamina, may actually be harder than it looks, especially if you don't know the monster's movesets too well. On top of that, ranged weapons do take more damage than any melee weapon out there, so that is something else to keep in mind. There are a few more mechanics to the bow, like for example the Dragon Piercer, where it is a very high commitment attack, you need to make sure that the monster is asleep or something. It's a good wake up tactic, but not something that you can rely on to deal some consistent DPS. There's also the Thousand Dragons, where you load your ammo into your bow and you deal a big shot like that, dealing a lot of damage. And the damage of that shot is going to change depending on what ammo type you are using. We did 666 with bomb pods, and now with the thorn pods we deal 556. I would say that the bow is by far the easiest weapon out of the ranged weapons to pick up and use, mostly because you are a lot more mobile compared to the rest of the bowguns, so if you are able to maintain critical distance between yourself and the monster and you are able to keep on attacking it, then the bow is going to do you quite nicely. However, just for being a ranged weapon, I don't think I would recommend it for a newer player, but with that being said, I would say that the bow is an easy weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World. Now the next weapon we have on the list is the Light Bowgun. This weapon allows you to keep attacking a monster from a pretty safe distance, all the while dealing some very decent damage. And because you are able to hit the monster so many times and in the case of the Light Bowguns, a lot of them have access to rapid fire, it ends up being one of the best weapons to do elemental damage with. As you can see, the weapon itself is quite fast, you're able to sheath it, unsheath it, all at a very fast pace, so you have a lot of leeway in being able to dodge monster attacks and keep on dealing damage, and especially with the Iceborne expansion, you now have access to a custom mod that allows you to reload a single bullet all the while evading and keep on attacking the monster, so you have even more utility and survivability with this weapon. Now something to keep in mind about the bogans is that you need to take into account this entire spreadsheet, the way that each of the different bogans interacts with the different ammo types for you to understand if this weapon can use this type of ammo and what it's best at doing. You've got spread ammo which is basically shotgun style up close to the monster and dealing a lot of damage with each pellet. Pierce ammo, as the name implies, does multiple hits and pierces the monster, so you need to make sure that you line it up with the monster to deal as much damage as possible. And of course you've got the elemental ammo types, and there are still some more unique ammo types like the dragon ammo for example. But all in all I would say that the light bogan is by far the most versatile out of the ranged weapons, being so fast and agile, all the while letting you deal damage from a pretty safe distance. You are also able to place down these Wyvern Blasts, which then you can blow up like this. And if you're playing in multiplayer, something that a lot of players often do is actually have a Light Bogan user be someone that uses Life Dust and Demon Powder and may potentially use Wide Range to heal their teammates as well, because again it is such a fast weapon that is often able to get out of dangerous situations very easily, and so you have more room to be able to consume an item to heal yourself or an ally. 
Again, I wouldn't really recommend a new player to start off with a ranged weapon, I just don't think, especially with having to farm for the different ammo types and with these weapons requiring some skills and some endgame optimization for them to truly deal some decent damage, at which point they end up doing tons of damage. But at the end of the day, I would say that the Light Bogan remains one of the easier weapons to pick up and use, and so I think it is fair for me to say that it is an easy weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World. Now the next weapon on the list is going to be the Heavy Bogan. Much like with the Light Bogans, you need to take into account this entire chart whenever you're playing with the Heavy Bogan, to truly understand how each of the different ammo types work with the weapon. That being said, the Heavy Bogan does have a big disadvantage going for it, and it's that the weapon is incredibly slow. It takes a long ass time for you to take out the weapon, especially if you don't have a full clip and you need to reload a bullet whenever you pick it up, just trying to dodge with this weapon takes a long ass time, and so you need to be conscious about all of this. That being said, you are able to equip a shield on your heavy bogan, so you are still able to take some knockback from a monster, and depending on your guard level, you can actually tank some of these hits without getting a lot of knockback. Now when it comes to heavy bogans, more likely than not, you're going to be either playing with spread ammo, so again we go back to the shotgun playstyle very up close to the monster and dealing a ton of damage. Or on the other hand, sticky ammo is also a very popular and extremely powerful playstyle with the heavy bogan, where you just attach all of these explosives to a monster and you keep on dishing out a ton of damage. A lot of times they won't even be able to get up, they'll keep getting stunlocked by all of this, and you can destroy a ton of monsters this way. There's also Cluster Bombs which used to be a lot more popular in the past, to deal a ton of damage to the monster this way by creating these massive explosions, however that was heavily nerfed in the Iceborne expansion and it's nowhere near as powerful right now. And then there is the Wyvern Ammo which is basically the same thing as the Gun Lance, which deals a ton of damage up close but has a very big windup. Another particular thing about the Heavy Bogans is that they do have a special bullet you are able to use, so if you take a look at the right hand side where I have my ammo, there is a bullet icon with a blue outline, you're able to load that special ammo, and in the case of this Heavy Bogan it is the Wyvern Snipe, which as the name implies you basically crawl down to the floor, you are entirely still and you are able to aim this very powerful bullet which deals a lot of damage and is especially useful for wake-ups. There is also the Wyvern Heart, where instead of having a sniper you have this huge machine gun where you just spam a lot of bullets into the monster dealing a ton of damage. As you can see that was 50 hits, totaling in 3500 damage. But again, the thing about the heavy bogans is that they do require you to have some endgame builds. You need to farm for this very powerful set in the endgame for them to truly deal some devastating damage, because up until that point they simply don't do a lot of damage. And because they are such slow weapons, and because you take more damage whenever you use ranged weapons, just a single mistake and you can die from a one shot. So you need to be very careful about how you use these weapons. Just cheesing your weapon to heal and then taking it out, if you didn't reload it before it's going to take a very long time, so within this downtime a monster can very easily one shot you especially in the endgame when they are very aggressive. So having said all of that, I think that I have to rate the Heavy Bogan as a medium difficulty weapon to learn in Monster Hunter World, because there is actually a lot that you need to take into account with this weapon. And this is how I would personally rank each of the different weapons in terms of difficulty. Of course, difficulty is all subjective, so let me know how you would rank each of the different weapons. And if you have enjoyed this video, then please subscribe to the channel and click that like button. With that being said, thank you all so much for watching, my name is Dark Hero, and as always, happy hunting!